Have you ever wondered how you can use photography as, as part of a creative process? Have you ever wondered how you can transform photographs into interesting and engaging art pieces? Have you ever wanted to create interesting photographs that look like this? Or artworks that look like this? It's that beautiful space where the realism of photography and the abstract beauty of art just come together. Today I'd like to, to answer these questions, or at least try to answer these questions, and I'd like to do so by showing you some really interesting concepts that maybe you haven't considered before. In today's discussion, I'd like to take you on a creative journey as we, as we unpack an Aladdin's cave of different options and different techniques that you may never have considered to be able to take your photography into a completely different realm. I want to discuss both in-camera techniques as well as handcrafted techniques where we roll up our sleeves and get physically involved to create art. My name is Martin Osner. I'm an artist, gallerist, curator, and teacher, and I am also a photographer. I've been involved in photography for all my life, but the last 25 years, I've specifically been involved in art photography and fine art photography. So before I get started in today's discussion, if you are a photographer or an artist, or you want to get involved in fine art photography, you'll find there's a link below where you can find out more. So let's get on with today's discussion. How do we go about adding a artistic layer to our work? And to answer this, I want to look at a number of different options. I want to consider in-camera techniques. I also want to consider digital techniques. I think with the, the apps and the software that we have today, we just cannot ignore that. And then I want to look at my favorite, hand techniques where we physically get involved in creating the artwork. Now, I am anticipating at least two questions that will come up after today's discussion will be, is photography in fact art? And the other will be, do I really need to uh, apply an artistic layer to my work? Do I really need to apply a technique to elevate it into the world of fine art photography? So let's answer the first question now. Is photography in fact art? Well, I think that's an undisputed fact. All you need to do is go and visit art galleries and art fairs today and you will see just how popular uh, art photography is, has become. You can just go on the internet and browse art collections and it will be evident there too. So, and I think the best is still to come. As far as I'm concerned, photography is the new kid on the block in any case. Now, when it comes to the question, why can't I just take a photograph without applying an artistic layer? Well, of course you can. There is just something so special about that decisive moment in photography where the shutter has just captured something so special or when light itself comes in and does its thing. I mean, the brilliant Ansel Adams, one of the greatest photographers of all time, said this. He said, sometimes I've arrived just when God is ready to have someone press the shutter. I mean, you look at his work here, Ansel Adams was an absolute genius when it came to working with light and capturing that moment. And you look at other photographers who also presented photography as a standalone medium. I mean, look at the work here of Dorothea Lang. I mean, she practiced her photography during the Great Depression and had this ability of being able to capture raw emotion. And then we go and we have a look at the, the, the brilliant Henri Cartier-Bresson, I mean, he was one of the best environmental portrait photographers of all time and one of the greatest street photographers of all time. And he always spoke about stealing that moment in time. So yes, pure photography has an incredible place in the world of art and fine art photography, and I would never dispute that. These decisive moments are rare. We all know that. And I don't know why it would need to be one or the other. Why can't we look at doing both? 
So when it comes to your normal photography, the amount of time you spend waiting for these decisive moments or waiting to be able to capture the splendor, what else is there? Well, this is where I think you can apply your artistic layers and this is where you can elevate your photography into a completely different level. So let's start off by looking at in-camera techniques and the moment I mentioned in-camera techniques and especially for those of you who've been doing photography for a while, the whole thing about ICM, intentional camera movement, comes up. So I'm not going to spend time on ICM today. I think there's more than enough information on the internet about doing ICM or in-camera movement. I want to look at maybe taking in-camera movement a little bit further. Have you ever considered using pinhole photography and then working using in-camera movement as part of it? So pinhole photography is where you would remove the lens of the camera and you would replace the lens with a tiny little pinhole. The light would come in through the pinhole itself and that would create an exposure onto the digital chip or of course on film if you're still using film. And just by the way, that, that light that comes through and that exposure that is made, that little bundle of light, the name of that light, and believe it or not, this is true, it's called a circle of confusion. And that's simply because it could never be sharp. But we could use this attribute in order to help to create a more of an artistic impression. And now you can go out even in bright light conditions and you can start to photograph. So instead of using a tripod like most pin holders would do, rather introduce camera movement and subject movement. And you can get the most interesting results. Have a look at some of these. In this photograph here, I took a picture of two people walking their dog uh, on the beach in nice bright sunlight. And you can see it has a, an incredible painterly expression. Here's another example. This was a security guard who was walking under a subway, so he had a nice bright green jacket. And again, using pinhole photography and then also using intentional camera movement, plus the fact that the security guard was also walking, uh, has created this artistic impression. Another fabulous technique we can consider in camera is multiple exposure. In today's new mirrorless cameras and some of the older DSLR cameras, they offer a multiple exposure facility. So when we think of multiple exposure, a lot of people think, well, that's just two pictures, one on top of the other. But have you considered taking layers and layers of photographs, one on top of the other in camera? Have a look at this example over here. This is a photograph I did early one morning, and it looks like it was photographed in the mist, but it wasn't. It was actually quite a clear day. The first photograph I took was of the scene itself. And then the second photograph, I went in a little closer and I took a second exposure. And that you can see up over here where the telephone pole has been duplicated. And then I did a third exposure to capture the cyclist. And then to give it a, a, a beautiful, soft, grungy type of misty look, this was of an old wall in a house nearby. So the combination of the texture plus the three exposures has again created a nice painterly expression. In this artwork here, I used layers upon layers upon layers. I think I must have exposed around about nine to ten layers on top of each other in camera. And you can see, and this is a combination of both the tree being repeated as well as nearby textures. So that is if we're photographing from a single vantage point. But have you considered maybe doing multiple exposures where you change the camera angle during the actual photography? Have a look at this example. So this is my Aura collection. I did three of these and I'll show you the other two in a moment. But here I photographed all around the subject. So I did multiple exposures, one after the other, and went 360 degrees around the subject. And that has created, again, this beautiful artistic impression. And then what about multiple exposure where you introduce in-camera movement? In this artwork here, this is exactly how it was done. So the forest itself has been created using a couple of multiple exposures on top of each other. And then I shot one out of focus, so that has created almost that like soft halo look and then on one of the exposures, I introduced in-camera movement. 
And then when it comes to multiple exposing, what about digital? What about using digital software? Can that be done? Well, I think the answer to any digital editing, and especially so when we talk about um, Photoshop, you know, when you say uh, Photoshop, I think it is so iconic you're talking about all digital software. So let's use it. So what about if we're using Photoshop? Can this be done with Photoshop? Well, the answer to Photoshop, and I suppose the answer to any question you ask when it comes to Photoshop is yes, of course it can. Have a look at this example over here. This is not one of mine. This is one of my daughters, Samantha. And here I'm going to show you the actual piece first. And you'll see that it's, it's got, again, a, a, a super ethereal look to it. And now let me show you the original. And you will see the original. I mean, it's, it's, it's rather plain and simple. But when it's being combined with multiple layers, like she's done it over here, one on top of the other, which are then being blended in editing software, it looks superb. So let's turn our attention towards hand techniques. And these are my favorite. I mean, this is really what's been keeping me busy for the last 25 odd years, looking for ways in which we can incorporate photography into an artistic realm and we can elevate photographs by applying techniques to them. Now, I must just put a disclaimer in place. There is no way today I'm going to be able to show you these techniques or introduce you these techniques and then still teach them to you. And if you find that, that you do like what you see, as I've said to you before, there is a link below that you can follow. I want to start off today with a fun technique, the hand painting and the embellishing of photographs. So the technique of hand painting and embellishing is nothing new. I mean, the technique itself dates right back to the 1800s. You must remember that right up until about the 1950s, uh, we didn't have color film available. So all the black and white prior to that, the pioneers of the past, many of them used to introduce color by hand. And if we fast track to the 1980s and 1990s, this is when uh, hand painting and embellishing became very popular. And specialized products were manufactured for silver gelatin darkroom prints to be able to apply color. And great artists like uh, Jan Saudek, for example, and Robert Rauschenberg used hand painting and embellishing as part of their creative process. And today we use watercolors and acrylics and pastels and all kinds of other things to create interesting works. So let's have a look at the simple photograph of a forest. It was black and white, and then onto that I added all the color. And now it's got that almost soft, vintage, ethereal look to it. You can also become quite quirky with hand painting. I mean, this is one of my two candy girls, and here you will see that the water coloring has been added. And I have combined reality with water coloring in this, in this artwork, but I think that's what gives it its quirkiness. And then if we look at this piece over here, you will see that it has an old historic look to it. Let me show you the original. And the original is nothing to write home about, but you will see that once the paint has been added, it gets that beautiful authentic look. And have a look at these old vintage cars. Again, just by using slightly different colors on them, they have been brought to life. If you enjoy abstract, then there is such an easy way that you can go about creating an abstract impression or abstract expression. And that's by adding physical paint to your print. And then once you have done that, you can always look at, at blending it back with the original to create something really interesting. Have a look at this as an example. Again, a forest of trees. Here is the black and white impression. And then here is the paint that has been added. And here is the result after we have blended it back with the original. And you can also be quite bold with it, as you can see in this artwork. And then if you enjoy creating moody impressions, consider solarization. Now this is a, a darkroom technique that dates back to the 1930s in photography. And the great artist Man Ray and his assistant at the time, Lee Miller, founded this technique and it was founded on a mistake. Lee Miller, unfortunately, while processing some of Man Ray's work prior to an exhibition, 
ended up fogging it to light and it created quite an interesting effect which later both E and Lee Miller used as they progressed in their art. Now the technique itself is quite simple. It's where your highlights are made darker and your shadows are made lighter. It's an inversion process. So today you can still do this technique by hand, but you can also do it digitally. So let's have a look at one or two of Man Ray's artworks. Here is a portrait that he did of Lee Miller. And here you will see in this artwork, he solarized it so heavily that the print has inverted completely. And let's go back to the forest. I'm going to show you this is a normal picture of a forest and have a look at how dramatically it changes once we apply solarization to it. So let's have a look at using transfers to create interesting art medium. Now, transfer itself simply means that you are taking your photograph and you are moving it onto another medium. And in doing so, you are altering its characteristics. So you'll see that the color will more than likely change. You're going to start to introduce a texture. And on top of that, you're going to introduce some grunge or breakup. Now, a lot of the inspiration for transfers comes from Polaroid. Polaroid, the brilliant instant imaging product of the past. It's no longer made today, so we've had to develop other ways of doing it. Now, there were predominantly two Polaroid methods. The one is known as the Polaroid image transfer, and the other was known as the Polaroid lift and transfer. Have a look at these examples over here. The one on the left and the one on the right is a Polaroid transfer, and then the one in the middle is a lift and transfer, and you can see the emulsion itself that is applied or stuck onto the picture. Inspired by the Polaroid lift and transfer, I was able to develop a technique called the solvent luminum transfer. And it's actually so simple. I mean, these lift and transfer during the days of Polaroid were quite difficult to do, but this is so simple. And have a look at what you can get from it. So if you look at the original here, and now you look at the result from the solvent luminant transfer, you will see it is dramatically different. So let's have a look at another method that we can image transfer. In this case, using a gel to facilitate the transfer from one medium to another. And here I'd like to show you one or two examples that Samantha, my daughter, has done. In this particular example, she used too much gel, so the ink started to run, but it has actually created an incredible abstract impression. And I just love this one. These two horses in the field. Now, I was out with her the day she photographed this, and I can promise you it was really busy. But the transfer has made it so much more simple. And then as an add-on, she has used another technique known as a bar relief, and it has created an incredible art piece. So the second last technique I'd like to show you in this discussion is what is known as a black powder or nitro transfer. How many of you enjoy charcoal impressions? And if I said to you, can you draw with charcoal? I'm almost sure that for many of us, we'd say, no, we don't have that skill. But do you know the camera can? By using the camera as a base or a foundation, you can transfer the picture using a black powder technique and you can get these incredible charcoal impressions. This is also a solvent-based technique. Have a look at this before and after. Here you will see how the photograph has changed completely using the black powder transfer and it's got such a historic look and you would agree with me that the, the grunge effect is just upon another level. So it, this technique can also be used as part of a process. Here in this artwork that I created of John Lennon, I use multiple black powder transfers all over the place. You'll see that these portrait down in the bottom corner here, there were three of these transfers on top of each other, and a whole lot of the other elements in this artwork were also put in using the black powder transfer. And this photo montage dates right back to the early 2000s when I was first experimenting with black powder transfers. And then lastly, speaking of photo montages, here is another way that you can elevate your photography to another level. You can do physical montages or you can do digital montages. Let me show you the difference. 
So here's a montage that's been created physically, and it also has a light solarization in it, just to give it that moody look. And here is a montage that I created digitally. And again, the multiple layers and the elevation and a little bit of shadow gives it a lot of interest. And there's other ways you can create photo montages as well. I mean, we spoke earlier about in-camera multiple exposure. Here's an example where two exposures were taken, one on top of the other, and it has a montage impression. This is a photograph which I took down in the subway in London, where the posters have been put on and peeled off, so it created a nice background. And then I simply just double exposed one of the other posters on top of it. So as you can see, you can do a physical montage where you physically build it yourself, or you can do a digital montage, or of course you can do multiple exposure. And here is an example of what is called a mirror montage, which is again a fairly simple technique, but it can be very effective. So as you can see, photography has no limit. Whether you want to use the camera to capture an image and leave it at that, or whether you want to bring photography into this beautiful dance space of art is completely up to you. At the end of the day, we only limited by our own imagination. And the greatest enemy of creativity, according to Picasso, is good common sense. So what are the steps then to get going? Well, first of all, you need to have a spirit of experimentation. And you need to understand that Mistakes are part of the process, whether it is the, the in-camera techniques we discussed earlier, whether it is these physical techniques, it doesn't really matter. It's only by practicing that you are going to learn, and it's only by making mistakes that you're going to get to find out what you need to do. And sometimes these mistakes are going to become some of your best art. I mean, let's think about it. Solarization, that came from a mistake in the darkroom. Polaroid lift and transfers, both of these techniques, iconic techniques, came out of making mistakes. You first need to learn the techniques and then what's really important is you need to surround yourself with like-minded people. I'm telling you now, you cannot practice art or photography in isolation. You need to have like-minded people around you to work with. Creating art is an investment in time. An investment in creating better quality photographs for yourself and your portfolio, but more importantly, an investment in your joy. I really hope you have found some value in some of the techniques we have discussed today. Go well and enjoy your creative process. Until next time, cheers for now.